All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our ALD Connect webinar on bone marrow transplant and life after transplant. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Kelly Mietnan. I'm the Executive Director of ALD Connect, and I'm honored to introduce our great panel of speakers tonight. We've got Dr. Troy Lund, an Associate Professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Division of Blood and Marrow Transplantation at the University of Minnesota. He is an international expert on the use of blood and marrow transplantation for patients with lysosomal storage disorders and inherited metabolic disorders, including ALD. Dr. Lund oversees one of the largest biorepositories in the world for these patient populations and other rare diseases. He has published extensively on various aspects of these disorders and made substantial contributions to the field with his work both in the clinic and the lab. Joining Dr. Lund to share their experience are Dan and Cassie Grow and Brock. Um, Brock had a successful BMT in January of 2019 at the University of Minnesota Masonic Children's Hospital. Brock is approaching day 500 post-transplant. He is asymptomatic and is doing amazing. And last but not least, we have a patient perspective from John Cooter. John was diagnosed with ALD in 1993 at the age of one. This early diagnosis was the result of a misdiagnosis of his older brother, but it gave John's doctors and family enough time to prepare for a bone marrow transplant, which took place in 1998 at the University of Minnesota. The transplant proved to be a success, and since then, John has thrived in all challenges in life, including earning the rank of Eagle Scout, um, having a successful stand-up career and gradu graduating from one of the nation's top engineering universities. Today, he's a mechanical engineer in Phoenix, Arizona, specializing in HVAC design for higher education and medical facilities. He is a familiar face on many ALD Facebook pages and many ALD-related conferences and events. So thank you to all of our panelists and to everyone for joining. Um, we'll start tonight by hearing about BMT from Dr. Lund. After that, Dan and Cassie uh, and John will share their stories, and then we will take questions. Um, tonight, we have all participants, uh, sorry, all participants muted, but please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to ask questions. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Troy Lund. Okay, thank you. Am I still coming in okay? Yes. Let's see. All right, and first slide should be up. Okay, good. All right, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about transplant and life after transplant. Uh, what I'm gonna say is, is it's supposed to elicit questions, so I'm going to cover transplant at a high level, and then kind of the the uh, role of allo transplant, uh, gene therapy, and then just um, how the transplant process works in general. And it's meant to generate more questions than answers, really. So, uh, as a reminder, everyone's on mute and use the question or chat room to send questions. Um, and then our disclaimers, uh, the information and services provided by LD Connector for informational purposes only. Uh, it's not to meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice. And if you or a family member are ill or suspect uh, a family member is ill, you should seek professional med medical attention immediately. LD Connect does not recommend or endorse any specific treatments, procedures, or products uh, that are mentioned here. And uh, participation in the webinar is completely voluntary. We're also recording this uh, webinar and we may broadcast it at a later date. So those are all our disclaimers. You have to move the people here to the side. Mm. All right, now my slide is not advancing. Let's see. Oh, there we go. All right, so I have about uh, 15 or 17 slides, something like that. Um, so, to start with just a brief piece of history on transplant, this is a photo of the first successful 
allogeneic bone marrow transplant, that is a transplant from another donor. It was performed in 1968 on a child with uh, immunodeficiency that was performed by Robert Good in, at the University of Minnesota. And so uh, the child, here's the young man getting fed by his donor sister. This, uh, man, this young man is now a man, he's in his 50s. Still comes the follow up uh, and is doing quite well uh, living on the East Coast and has a family of his own. So that's kind of where the successful transplant started. So, what are the principles of transplant? Well, the principles are uh, pretty basic and fundamental. We give very high doses of chemotherapy. These, this is a similar regimen or the same regimen we use to treat leukemias and lymphomas. And we, in the past, used to do this with radiation, though now radiation has all but disappeared from most regimens, uh, except for a couple. Um, and the point is to really just obliterate the bone marrow and get rid of the old immune system. Uh, it also immunosuppresses the patient uh, to some extent as well. The transplant itself uh, replaces an abnormally functioning, functioning bone marrow uh, with healthy hematopoietic cells. Now, oddly enough, and this is where it relates to some of the metabolic storage diseases like adrenal leukodystrophy, is that some of these cells go to the brain. It's difficult to tell you how many um, or what percentage, because it's vastly understudied. There's literally one or two papers that have looked at this in human beings uh, for the obvious reasons that you need a brain biopsy, but plenty of studies have confirmed uh, these findings in mice. Uh, so we know it's a phenomenon that occurs, and we know that um, probably chemotherapy is required to have it occur. Uh, there are various types of transplants. Uh, there's the syngeneic twin to twin transplant, which I won't be discussing. There's the autologous transplant, which uses your own cells. Uh, this is uh, along the lines of a gene therapy approach. And then there's the allogeneic transplant, which is the oldest type of transplant, um, where you use an, a donor which may be related to you or may be unrelated to you. Um, and the donor can be uh, fully matched or perfect matched. Uh, sometimes the donors are mismatched. Um, and then the source of cells uh, can make a difference. We now have umbilical cord blood transplants, or UCB. Uh, peripheral blood stem cells can be isolated. And then we have the classic um, marrow transplant, um, where we get the term bone marrow transplant. These are all hematopoietic stem cell transplants. I'll probably use the term bone marrow transplant just uh, for sake of ease, or I'll use BMT, recognizing that uh, it doesn't necessarily mean actual marrow is used. So what's the goal for transplant for ALD? Well, this is a, an MRI from a, a young boy with ALD, age six, pre-transplant. Many of you are uh, familiar with ALD and have seen or experienced or read about uh, the MRIs. And you can see on the left, uh, the demyelination that's occurring. And on the right, the gadolinium enhancement, uh, what we call the garland ring of enhancement. Um, this is the same boy 28 days after transplant. You can see that the, the damage there has been done. Um, it does not change the scan on the left, but you notice the scan on the right, uh, all the gadolinium is completely gone. And this is what we call the extinguishment of disease, or I call it ALD, cerebral ALD in remission, uh, because now we believe the disease is quiescent. Uh, though I'll remind you on the left, uh, whatever's been demyelinated uh, stays demyelinated. Um, and hopefully it doesn't get uh, significantly worse, but at least the active process of ALD uh, has been extinguished. So what are the outcomes uh, historically for transplantation? Um, a lot of the outcomes are based on severity of disease. Uh, we use a, a severity scale. Uh, uh, we score these MRIs, uh, the ones on the left, by the number of structures involved. Um, we call that an MRI score, or we call it a LESS score after uh, Dr. Daniel Less, who developed the system at Minnesota. Um, and we have risk stratification. So if you're an individual with a very with a low MRI score of less than nine, 
those kiddos do exceedingly, exceedingly well after transplant with a greater than 90% survival. The advanced kids, uh, greater than or equal to nine, do less well, uh, and they just have more transplant comp complications, and they have a tendency to progress after transplant. So what about uh, um, outcomes uh, by graph source? Now this is again looking at just the kiddos with uh, low MRI scores or low less scores. Uh, in our experience, using a related donor, that is a brother or that is a sister uh, or a, uh, or I guess a non-carrier sister or a brother as a donor, we have 100% survival, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, using an unrelated donor, we still have pretty good survival with uh, about an 80% survival at eight years or so. So this is fairly modern data uh, in terms of what you will see published. So what about the transplant outcomes of uh, early ALD versus no therapy? This is a uh, historical slide. On the bottom is years from an abnormal MRI and then the percentage of survivals on top. You can see when we uh, did not do transplant, that is the red line going downward, um, those children did not do well over 15 years with um, a large majority of them passing away. Uh, though with transplant and early, early LD, again, we see this 90% plus uh, survival, which is uh, very good. It's not 100, which is where we'd like it to be. So we still have transplant complications, uh, but um, this is where we're at today. So that is all historic data uh, on allo transplant uh, about three or four years ago. Gene therapy was starting to, be de starting to be developed for a lot of diseases, including ALD. Some of the pilot data uh, has been uh, published. Uh, our group was involved in generating uh, this data through the recruitment of patients and the transplant process. And uh, this may be uh, a future therapy uh, for the treatment of ALD. And it's still in um, clinical trials right now as we speak, uh, but it's uh, getting quite mature in, in terms of how long it's been around now. So I'll remind you that um, the way this works is that on the left, cells in an individual, i.e. a boy with ALD, are mobilized through a growth, growth factor. And what that means is that you're given uh, a a growth factor or a stimulator that drives the stem cells out of the bone marrow and into the peripheral blood. This is to generate large numbers of stem cells that then can be extracted through an IV process uh, rather than having a bone marrow, um, uh, basically a bone marrow aspiration. So again, all the stem cells, are, the bulk of the stem cells can be driven into the periphery. Uh, the, on the bottom, you see the stem cells then uh, have the gene uh, that's disrupted added back into them. This is uh, the lentivirus that encodes the uh, ABCD1 gene affected in ALD. And then uh, when that product, and that's what we call it as a product, meets lot release criteria, it gets infused back into the boy. Now the boy has to undergo chemotherapy for the process to work efficiently. So in fact, the chemotherapy that is used in gene therapy is the same chemotherapy that we use for other patients getting a uh, transplant from a brother or sister. Um, it's B-sulfan and cytoxin. Uh, and then um, after the uh, four to seven days of chemotherapy, the cells are infused and uh, you have recovery and follow-up just like you would for any other transplant. So a lot of times I just try to remind families that gene therapy is actually a, a transplant um, and very similar to a, a classic transplant, except the cell source is the patient's own cells that have been fixed. When we look at uh, expression of the disrupted protein in ALD, and it's actually called the ALD protein, that's the thing that has gone wrong in boys with ALD, we look at that expression in boys with that had undergone gene therapy. And we can see that expression is restored anywhere from a 10% uh, and up to a 50% level. And this, 
expression is somewhat stable over at least two years, uh, as shown in this uh, data slide here taken from the paper. Uh, further out from that, uh, that data has yet to be published. I do remind families uh, and people that ask me about gene therapy is that it's not exactly like an allotransplant because uh, we can only fix about 20 to 25 percent of the cells uh, prior to infusion. So when you have a, a, a donor source that's a, a brother or sister, we have 100 percent of the cells expressing ALDP, whereas in gene therapy, the best technology achieves about 20, 25 percent correction. So not all the cells are fixed. In fact, only a minority of them are fixed. But we remain, we remain hopeful that, the, that this is enough cells um, that are fixed uh, to stabilize and arrest the disease. And this is just some of the pilot data uh, looking at the MRI scores of boys after gene therapy. You can see many of the boys in the brown lines remain pretty stable. I'll tell you that Almost every boy with ALD, their score goes up a little bit over time. There's not very many patients who don't gain a point or two after transplant. Um, some patients uh, did gain a few more points than the majority of them, but the majority of the patients did pretty well uh, just gaining a, a few points. You can't see all the patients because they're um, smashed down on the bottom with uh, just zero or one points gain. So you only see the patients actually gain more points so that it's a little confusing. Um, we get questions about, well, how does this compare to allo transplant? And the answer is there's not really been a head-to-head -head study done uh, to know how this progression uh, uh, compares to the classic form of transplant. I can only say that, that virtually all patients do gain uh, some points. Um, no matter what kind of transplant you have. So this kind of data is, uh, looks uh, promising uh, from a gene therapy point of view, uh, and we're hopeful uh, as we uh, enroll a few more patients on the remaining uh, clinical trial spots. Now I just wanna briefly touch on what is it like uh, to go through transplant? And again, this will apply to um, uh, the classic allogeneic transplant, and also to, to gene therapy with a couple of exceptions. Uh, and so there's the chemotherapy infusion, or the chemotherapy infusion, so that's getting the, the fludarabine or the cytoxin or the busulfin. Busulfin is common to just about every transplant protocol. And again, the chemotherapy is pretty similar, uh, if not identical, between gene therapy and BMT. What's that like? Most people experience uh, some nausea, but the new medicines that we have for nausea are outstanding at preventing nausea. And most kids just fly through this. Um, they're usually up eating, playing with their cars, uh, doing whatever during these infusions. Um, so not too bad. Kids tolerate them really well. It's really uh, the next five to 15 days that you have the side effects from, trans, uh, from the chemotherapy. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. The transplant itself, uh, I think I have a picture pretty unremarkable. It's this bag of what looks like blood. It infuses uh, into an IV and it's done in, in usually 10 to 25 minutes. Very uh, uh, lackluster. Most kids sleep through it actually because we give them Benadryl pre-medication. The side effects from chemo that occur uh, in the next week um, include things like the mouth sores um, that you all hear about, uh, mucositis we call it, it can be uh, mild or severe. Um, it can be somewhat painful. Kids can stop eating for a while. It's our most common side effect, I would say. Uh, inevitably, it always heals about two and a half weeks after transplant, but it can be tough on the kid. Um, the other side effects include any kind of um, organ toxicity, like liver or kidney problems from the chemotherapy, because these are potent drugs. Um, and um, you want to be careful uh, using them, and we uh, monitor all these uh, organ functions while the kid's going through transplant. Uh, what else is common? Hair loss is, again, we all recognize the, the kids that have received chemo. The hair, hair stem cell follicles are very sensitive to chemotherapy. So about a week after transplant, the hair does come out, uh, and you, you see the kiddos, they're, you know, they're bald and, and don't have any hair. The hair does uh, return 
uh, a few months later, uh, um, almost back to its, its normal state. Um, and so that's another side effect. Um, you can have some nausea and vomiting uh, for weeks after transplant. I mentioned the not eating part. Uh, Uh, and if it's in remission. <clears throat> versus host disease, which commonly is a skin rash from the transplant, or it can be uh, significant diarrhea uh, if the graft uh, attacks the gut, or it can be a liver disease. This is very specific to um, non-gene therapy uh, transplants. In the autologous or gene therapy transplant, uh, graft versus host disease does not exist because the graft came from the boy himself, and so it will not react against him. So again, specific to allotransplant. <clears throat> and then finally, long-term follow-up. Um, so what are we doing every year for these boys that go through transplants? Uh, I check blood counts every year. I get MRIs every year just to keep track of the disease, uh, what's going on with it. I check engraftment every year to make sure the donor cells are in place. And then every year there are physical exams just like before. I'm looking for pancreas problems, thyroid problems, uh, things like that. Again, these are all systems that uh, are affected by chemotherapy up front uh, that we have to use and may result in later uh, sequelae later in life, like these organ problems. Always doing a skin exam. Anyone who's received chemotherapy is at a higher risk for skin cancer later in life. Um, and that's why we always advise our patients to use lots of uh, SPF 50 sunscreen when they're out in the sun, or avoid being out in the sun altogether if you can, again, because their skin stem cells have experienced chemotherapy and that causes uh, breaks and it just puts them at a higher risk. This is true for any patient getting a transplant, not just ALD, not just gene therapy. Uh, in the physical exam uh, department, I'm also looking at progression um, uh, to see how the kids are doing neurologically and I'm always looking at immune problems. So this is the first part of what I have to present, again, a high level view of, of the classic transplant, some things on gene therapy, and then um, kind of what the transplant process is, uh, is like. And now we'll hear uh, from Dan and Cassie. I will stop, stop sharing my screen and move on. So we are Dan and Cassie Grohl, and our son, like Kelly said, is Brock. So Brock has been monitored from birth for ALD. Um, he, his lesion was detected on 12-3-18, and at that time he had a less score of between two and three. Um, we went to the U, Dr. Lund was his transplant doctor, and things moved pretty quickly from there after the pre-workup appointments. We found a match. Brock didn't have a perfect match. It was um, a seven out of eight cord blood match. We proceeded with that. We didn't wait for the gene therapy study to open. I believe that year, it was in 2019, I think it might've opened in March or April, but we didn't wanna wait just knowing with ALD how quickly things can move. So we are admitted into the hospital on January 8th of 2019, and Brock had his transplant on 
January 28th of 2019. And Dr. Lund is right, it's a, it's a bag of blood and Brock was kind of crabby and we were <laughs> crying and Brock didn't think too much of it. <laughs> so we were in the hospital for 31 days total, we got discharged on day plus 21. So every day leading up to transplant is a negative day. Transplant is day zero. So Brock got discharged on day plus 21. And we went to the Ronald House from there and stayed up in Minneapolis. We're from Minnesota, um, but not close to the metro area. So we stayed at the Ronald McDonald House up there and we were admitted back into the hospital a couple of times um, once for a bacteria infection in Brock's line his central line and then he had a virus um, a stomach virus so probably a little bit after day 100 that we got hospital I think only for a day just to get some fluids um, we were in isolation with him. So we were, came back home on day 100, um, which I believe was May 8th for us. And then we still kind of isolated um, for the most part because Rock was still on immunosuppression medication. So he was on cyclosporin. So tips from us. Um, for the BMT process, obviously really rely on your support system, swallow your pride, ask for help. We thought we would be able to do our laundry and fortunately, Dan and I both were be able to be with Brock during the entire time of his hospitalization. And we know that not every family has that luxury, but Dan and I were able to be there. Um, and even just doing our laundry was a lot of work when you're worried about your child. So we asked my parents and they graciously were coming up almost every other day, if not daily, while we were in the hospital to grab our laundry and do our laundry for us. So we could focus on Brock. Really try to make the experience as positive as you can. Um, we had a lot of doctors and nurses comment when we were in the hospital, just how positive Dan and I tried to remain for Brock. And we really think it had a huge impact on Brock's overall, overall well-being. If you if you can stay calm and stay positive, you know your, your child will, you know, take you from that, and that'll help them stay calm and positive. So um, we really tried to. If we did have a tough day or a tough conversation, we definitely want to do it in front of him and get him worried because he is young, but um, you know he can see the worry. Um, so we we tried to stay very positive. Though. Taking um, breaks for sure. So Dan would exercise almost daily. Um, my family would come up and take me out for lunch or supper periodically. Um, just making sure you're doing self-care. Um, we got a lot of support just from connecting with other families in the ALD community. Um, we knew a family that where their son was three weeks ahead of Brock. So we were like, going through the transplant process right along with them and that was really supportive. So. Brock's tips. So these are all from Mr. Brock. Um, <laughs> learning how to swallow pills, that was his number one. So Brock did not know how to swallow pills before we went into the hospital and the care team really there helped us with that. So we started off with just swallowing candy, like Tic Tacs to start off with. And then we got to the bigger pills and he was swallowing the pretty big cyclosporin 100 milligram pills there, which Brock says smells like a skunk, which he's not lying about that. So mm -hmm. um, dye in your hair a fun color, you can see Brock's hair. So he wanted a blue mohawk before we ended up shaving his hair. And Brock ate a lot of McDonald's when he was on prednisone. And after that, he did lose his appetite after he was off that steroid. So we would let him eat anything and everything. He wanted ice cream in the middle of the night, we would go get it just because 
you want them eating as much as you can. So that's post BMT, so pre BMT is on the left. That was before the lesion was detected. That's Brock's school picture on the right after transplant. So you can see the cycle sporin, eyebrows, darker hair. Um, Brock is considered to be asymptomatic. He has a neurologic function score of zero. He's doing amazing. The only thing that we can really think of, and we're not sure if it's transplant related, but he does have some minor skin issues compared to prior to transplant. He, I would say he has eczema um, now, and he never had that before, and maybe that's just something he would have developed otherwise, but yeah, we really watch the sunscreen still with him. And he continues to have um, annual, annual MRIs with Dr. Lund at the U. So his MRIs are in January of every year. And day 500 is tomorrow. So that is Brock now wearing his gopher apparel always. That's tonight. This is Brock. Hi. <laughs> Oh, yep, sounds, I think we're going to hear from John next. All right. So let me share my screen here. <laughs> there we go. Hopefully everybody can see it. All right. So my name is John Kuderer. And in this picture right here to the left is me, adorable as always. Uh, sometime in about 1995 or so, I was about, five, or 1997, I should say, I was about five years old at this time, and to my right is my brother, Joey. Now, uh, he unfortunately got a misdiagnosis. It came a little bit late in the game. Uh, he had what you would typically see when somebody gets misdiagnosed and with ALD, he lost a lot of uh, motor abilities, a lot of communication abilities, eating abilities, anything like that. And he was wheelchair bound uh, like that for several years. But because of his misdiagnosis, I was able to get diagnosed and I was able to get diagnosed at one years old, shockingly. So between the ages of one years old and five years old, my or six years old, my parents were able to, you know, keep track of this stuff. I was on cortisol for uh, Addison's disease. And for the most part, I was a normal kid. Um, here I am with a couple pictures of me and my cousin. We would always go camping, go up north. Our family, you know, being from Wisconsin and a Midwest, uh, we're all very close. So lots of holidays together, lots of weekends together. And I, I was a normal kid. Uh, we did the MRI scans and when they first started I had a less score of one and we kept doing them every six months and one time I had a less score of two. All right, we saw a change and let's get this bone marrow transplant rolling. But before we had the bone marrow transplant rolling, I had to have my Make-A-Wish, of course. Uh, if anybody grew up in the 90s and you knew how big Nickelodeon Studios was at the time, so my wish was to get slimed at Nickelodeon Studios. And there's a picture of me in the tub getting this mm -hmm. bucket covered me, covered on. And there's my certificate that says Johnny and that I'm an official slime kid. Uh, that is actually still hanging up at my wall right now. I, like I can see it, it's right over there. So something that I've kept with my entire life. So for my bone marrow transplant, unfortunately we didn't have any family members that could actually become donors. But somehow, some way, we found a donor from Germany. And this is like northern Germany, I, not even close to any of the major cities. And he was a six for six match. So the Grow family talked about having eight for eight or seven for eight matches. I had six for six. So, like, they're constantly learning and making these transplants better. And we were talking about kind of that pregnisone face and that steroid face. Uh, the pictures on the right are about four months apart. So I just 
ballooned right up. Uh, I had the nice chubby face, lost the hair, kept the eyebrows. Don't know why, but uh, <laughs> definitely uh, looked a little bit different during the transplant. And then I want to say the, the best thing after a transplant could have happened after this is a whole bunch of nothing happened. Uh, I, you know, I still continue living with uh, Addison's disease and I take Cortef. I have hypothyroidism, so I take uh, medication for that. But literally, I was all throughout grade school, high school, um, all the way up to college, normal kid, absolutely. Um, just a whole lot of nothing. I became, I did plays, I joined Boy Scouts, I became an Eagle Scout, I served on student council, I just did a whole bunch of stuff and I was completely normal about this. Nobody knows that I have ALD until I tell them. And in 2015, uh, I walked, I didn't graduate, I walked <laughs> um, <laughs> from the uh, Milwaukee School of Engineering and I graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, I took a couple class after this picture took was taken, but I was able to get this degree and this school was tough. I mean, it had a 60, 65% dropout rate. And, you know, I was able to successfully get this degree and it opened up so many doors for me. And I think I landed in what I would say is my dream job right now. Uh, I'm a HVAC engineer, so I designed the heating and cooling system, anything that has to do with ventilation. And we specialize in higher education, laboratories, hospitals. Um, I've done airborne isolation rooms where you got to make sure that nothing comes or goes out of it. I've done immunosuppressant rooms where you have to make sure nothing comes into it. And I've done so many MRI machines and I know exactly how they work and read so many manuals. And it's just, it's amazing to, you know, be able to give back in some way and go I was a little kid in this not not even that long ago I mean it's been 22 years ago I was this little kid having the bone marrow transplant and now I'm designing these rooms that are you know going to save these just more and more kids it's um, real humbling when I think about it and I mentioned before that my bone marrow donor is from Germany and this past year during Oktoberfest I had the opportunity to go out to Germany. Uh, this is a picture of me and my fraternity brothers. It was amazing. There was 25 of us. Not sure how we organized 25 of us to go down to Germany, but I wrote to my donor and uh, he wrote back to me and we decided to organize a meetup. So after I was able to have, you know, some fun in Munich, I went out and met him. And so this is a picture of me and me, my fraternity brothers, just to the left, and then here is my uh, bone marrow donor. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but he's just to the right of me in that picture. And this is all of his family and friends. So like, it was just amazing to see how he lived, see where he came from, and he opened up this entire scrapbook of every form of communication ever that my parents had with him, that my uh, other family members had with him. He had, you know, the letter saying that you've been selected. He had the letter saying like it was successful and just so many different memories he was able to pull out. So this is a picture of him and me. And this was taken just last September and it was just amazing to, you know, kind of come full circle to, to finally see where it all started. And so I'm just, I'm, thankful for everything and I want to give back to the community as much as I can. So this is my email address. I have people, you know, reach out to me, email me anytime that you need help, anytime that you need to get that patient adult perspective. Cause I know a lot of parents have kids out there and they don't quite understand what their kids are going through or they wish that they could just kind of like understand and get some a footing as to what's going on. So absolutely reach out to me, ask me any questions. I will gladly go through anything that I've been through and I'm just always glad to help out. So thank you so much, everybody. Great. All right. 
Now I think we, uh, looks like we have time for questions, which is good. And so I will uh, look at some of the questions that have come in and uh, ask them, uh, answer them or, or ask them to the panel. So one question is, uh, what is a less score? Uh, that's uh, easy and hard to answer. It's It's hard without showing slides, but it is essentially a score of brain structure involvement for ALD. It was developed by Dr. Daniel Less at the University of Minnesota in the 1990s. Um, and so it's one to 34 points. You uh, essentially start at zero, uh, as we all should be at zero, I hope. Um, and then you get a point for each structure involved. Interestingly, the score does not uh, depend on how much area of the brain is involved. So it's really number of structures. So you can have a large area involved and have a point, have one point, uh, or you can have lots of small structures involved and have five or six points. So it's a, it's a bit of an usual scoring system, but it is one of our best measures of disease involvement uh, for ALD um, and probably one of our only measures for disease involvement. We're constantly looking to refine our scoring system, uh, but it does allow us to separate patients into high risk, uh, very high risk and low risk. And, and certainly when we see changes on the MRI and we realize patients are getting points, um, we start thinking about transplant. Um, interestingly, the less score has nothing to do with the gadolinium enhancement that I showed and discussed with you earlier. Um, let's see, uh, for children with the gene for ALD that don't have siblings uh, that are bone marrow matches, uh, Will the Bluebird Biogene Therapy trial be available to them in the near future? Uh, yeah, I think that's true. The goal of the trial is to show safety and then efficacy of the therapy, then ultimately take the clinical trial findings uh, to the FDA to get approval uh, to, to have it available uh, as a medicine. And so we're at the I don't know, at the tail end of four years now or so. And so in the near future, um, it will be available uh, to patients. I'm not exactly sure um, uh, what if or what criteria will be attached to it, whether it'll just be low risk patients uh, or whether high risk patients be excluded or men be excluded. I don't know the answer to that, uh, but it will be available to, to children in the future. Um, <clears throat> If we know how, if we know transplants stop ALD, why can't they be done before brain damage or lesions? Always a good question. Um, despite the advances in transplant and gene therapy, um, there is risk because you are giving high doses of chemotherapy medicines, uh, busulfan and others, and there is a risk of uh, developing organ toxicity and or infection and the risk can be severe enough and can be life ending. Um, and so at this point in time, um, I remind the audience that um, the cerebral form affects probably four out of 10 boys by age 18. That means six out of 10 aren't gonna have the cerebral form. And so we don't necessarily put everybody through that risk because six out of 10 might not need to undertake that risk. Uh, not until we can develop more um, medicinal-based therapies would we do that, i.e. non-transplant therapies. Um, so that's why not everybody gets uh, transplanted. Um, let's see, for, uh, for John, uh, Cassie, and Dan, is there any, so for, for you guys, uh, the patients, is there anything that you would have done differently is the question for, for you guys, both of you, I suppose. So for us, um, I think just again, asking for help from your support system right away and not trying to do things on your own, um, kind of just swallowing your pride um, in the beginning of the transplant. For me personally, I think I wish uh, I stayed a little bit more diligent with physical therapy that my 
parents and all the doctors were putting me through, uh, I did end up being bedridden for a couple weeks, about two to three weeks. So that was difficult relearning how to almost walk and regain those muscles. So wish I wasn't as stubborn. <laughs> okay, good. And then related to uh, this follow-up is a follow-up. Is there something that you all learned through your transplant that you wish you knew earlier? And was there anything that surprised you about the transplant process? Uh, I, I don't really have much to say on what surprised me because I mean, the whole thing surprised me. I was six years old, but I wish our um, learning now uh, in the past year kind of what are the long, long-term effects of bone marrow transplant when it comes to how it affects your brain, how it affects your memory, what other types of um, just symptoms that you can develop. Uh, I wish I was told this kind of stuff when I was a teenager rather than an adult, just so I could have more knowledge and be more prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. We asked Brock this, and he said during the transplant, he was surprised that he had to be hooked up to his IV stand, which he calls his power machine, um, all the time. So towards the end, you get capped off, but... Yeah, he's giving me a thumbs up being hooked up to that IV 24 seven. Um, and then with Dan and I, I guess just again, the hospitalization part, just be prepared for nurses and doctors to be in your room all day, every night. Chemo happens that night, which we were surprised to learn and there's beeping and you're not gonna get much sleep and it's just how it is. Great. Um, let's see, there's uh, a few questions in, in one here that I can try to answer all at once. Um, wondering if the what the process is if the patient does not have a good match. My son is a mixed race, and I've heard that patients who are mixed race can have more difficult time finding a match. This is related to other questions about who should get tested to be a BMT donor and what is the haplo and, and things like that. So, um, so I get the question a lot, who should be tested? So the best outcomes, uh, which I showed you were uh, at 100% for us, was, was the brother and sister donor. Uh, and so they'll always produce the best outcomes uh, in terms of transplant safety. Um, and so we test brothers and sisters. We prefer that prefer, prefer them not to be carriers and um, they can be in they can potentially be a perfect match, but that only occurs in 25% of families just because of the way that genetic dice are rolled. Um, and so are you likely to match your other family members? Generally not because we're all made up of half mom, half dad, and then all of our aunts, uncles, cousins are made up of a mix of DNA. And so you really are not likely to match anyone else in your family very well unless your family happens to be extremely inbred. Um, and this can occur in cousins that marry and produce children and other families that are so-called very close like that. It does occur once in a while. Uh, when I get a question from families like that, I just encourage them to have a donor drive. And this goes back to the mixed race part. Uh, I encourage uh, certainly those that are of mixed race to have the donor drives and get like uh, get similar individuals to donate because that's where we're really having a problem. Uh, nor those of Northern European descent generally always have matches and sometimes multiple matches from one or two. And I've seen 50 matches for a patient before because uh, the HLA type is so common. But once you, um, you know, if you have African American or you have um, American Indian or other mixes, it gets very hard to, uh, it can get very hard to match patients. So, so I encourage uh, as much as I can uh, those types of donor drives because we really have to build the inventory on, on, uh, for the mixed races. Um, uh, what is a haplo transplant? Haplo is essentially half matched. So we do have a, a protocol or two where we can use a half match. There are certain conditions 
uh, high risk conditions, including ALD, where I might use a father as a donor, actually. Uh, and the father and the son is half of the father, and we call that a haplotransplant. Uh, and that transplant is actually um, getting a lot more attention uh, and success in the field of cancer biology uh, than ALD. But there are times where we use a haplo. You can also have aunts and uncles that are haplos. Um, you could also have brothers and sisters that are haplos. Technically, uh, they could be half matched. Um, so that's all haplo means: is that you know you share half the genetic material. Uh, is BMT covered by insurance? Uh, generally, yes, um, it is covered by insurance. Um, how, should, how soon do we look for a, a match? I go back and forth on this myself, um, just because sometimes we look for a match right away, but if the child is six, month old, six months old with ALD, uh, statistically, if the child needs a transplant between age four and seven, that donor pool is gonna change a ton uh, and so we might not do the matching until later, just because a lot more donors are going to be in the pool and the results will change. Um, so sometimes they hold off, but sometimes parents really want to know what the, what matches are out there anyway, even if their child's one month old. Um, so um, we'll negotiate on that. Um, for John, well, you got to meet your donor, which is usually a, a pretty rare event and a pretty special event. Do you know why he donated? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think uh, he saw one of those um, Be the Donor advertisements in his hometown, and he just wanted to do something that, you know, felt like he was contributing. And he had that same, you know, passion when they called him because every once in a while you'll get called to be a donor and they have every right to say no. So when he did get the call, he, you know, he was super excited about it. He was going to be able to, you know, give back to the community in some way. So just selflessness is really what drove him to do it all. Oh, that's amazing. No, that's, that's, it's a really cool story. So I like that. Um, let's see, uh, schedule. Should we schedule bone marrow drive? Yep, I always answer you up. The, all the information is on uh, uh, the Be The Match website, uh, so you can find it there. Um, is it important to get a BMT at one of the major centers like uh, University of Minnesota, KKI, Boston Children's, or can it be done somewhere else locally? It's always a tricky question for me uh, because I'm one of the major centers, um, and so, uh, so, it's, so I'm biased towards what we do. Um, I can tell you our, our depth of knowledge and experience is, is tough to beat. And so I think like every other medical field um, where this has been looked at, including intensive care units and, and uh, myocardial infarction outcomes, the more experience a center has, the better the outcome. The more patients they see, the better the outcome. And again, this is just another medical specialties. Um, transplant for ALD is not necessarily like a, a cookbook. You're not really just following a recipe. You have to stay attuned to what's going on in the patient. And so, you know, I think what our skill is, is identifying, is it ALD progression or is it a side effect of their medicine? Um, when other transplant centers call me, that's one of the most common questions I get is, is, is my patient progressing or is it the medicines? And, and so while there are lots of transplant centers in the country, I do advise patients to, to at least get an opinion and a consult at a very experienced center. If not ours, uh, there are a few others around the country. Uh, and so my bias would be uh, toward the center that has done lots of transplants. And I always encourage every family to say, well, ask, ask their center, how many have you done? What do the outcomes look like? Uh, they should all have that answer ready for you. Um, so again, that's just kind of my bias and, and personal opinion, uh, but that's how I, I'd advise things. Uh, and I, I can throw this question out to, to you guys too. I mean, I know the girls are from Minnesota, but were you ever given advice on that or? So 
We actually started off at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Raymond was the one following Brock from birth. And then Dr. Raymond had um, left the U of M. We actually went to Mayo in Rochester and that's where the lesion was detected. And we went back to the U. So we're here in Minnesota. We know we're fortunate. We're about an hour away from each of those hospitals. Um, we won't change our experience. Obviously, we're biased too. So yeah, we're really biased. The, the University of Minnesota. We're, I mean, the whole team was just absolutely incredible. I mean, could not have expected anything better. So um, it was a very, very positive experience from the certain you know, the providers. So. Uh, granted, this is 1998, but Wisconsin said that they don't do bone marrow transplants for ALD, so we had to go somewhere else. And luckily, Minnesota is just you know across the border, so yeah. we kind of de facto ended up at University of Minnesota. Yeah. No, oh, I'm well. Of course, I'm glad everyone was there. Um, we we were certainly early into the field, so uh, that kind of explains it. Um, and then see what else is on the, the list here. Um, I guess one question for uh, the Grove families, how is Brock doing with education and learning and development, things like that? That I get that question a lot too. It's like, how's my kiddo gonna be? <laughs> right. well, well, that was one thing I think going into it. Yeah, it's a huge concern. Um, you're always worried that, you know, is he gonna be able to keep up in class and or is he gonna lose a little bit of that edge? You know, we're happy to report that he had a fantastic year back at first grade and did exceedingly well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like on reading tests, like I remember the first quarter he was supposed to read like, you know, something like 40 words per minute and he read 70. So, I mean, like not only was he doing what he, you know, meeting his standards, he was exceeding them. Um, you know, he's, he's very physically active, been in soccer. I mean, if there's if there's any sort of small minor deficit anywhere, we sure won't feel notice. I mean, he's he's a fantastic little boy and full of life. He's articulate. He can put together complex Lego sets. Yeah, he's doing very well. He's doing it all. He's, he's <laughs> fantastic. Uh, one more uh, question here. Looks like our time is almost up. But our transplants for children with cerebral LD and and not for adults with cerebral LD. Uh, well, in fact, we assess, or I assess uh, uh, with my team, a number of adults that develop cerebral disease. It can happen. Uh, we don't know how common it is. If the adult is otherwise doing well, uh, I will refer them uh, to transplant. It's a combination of teamwork between my adult bone marrow transplant physician colleagues and myself uh, with the expertise in ALD. Uh, the the problem with adults with cerebral disease is that they're often picked up very late. And so they're very affected uh, physically and mentally and transplant outcomes really fall off uh, when you become affected. And so the trick is trying to pick up adults with cerebral disease early. Uh, if and when that can happen, uh, the outcomes can be actually quite well. Uh, it can be quite good. Uh, there's not that many patients that have been published upon uh, perhaps 30 or 40 in the world, uh, but yeah, 